The Hard Truth with Akosia Kunedu. Only on Vice at One. Brought to you by Echo Bank. Three African countries have made a decision to leave the International Criminal Court with a few more expected to follow suit. What does this mean for the future of the ICC and its mandate in Africa? What about the recent win of President-elect Donald Trump in the US election? What does it mean for the African people and Africa as a whole, particularly in relation to immigration? And coming home, the elections are just a few uh, weeks away and questions of the protection of our democracy are rife. Tonight on The Hard Truth, we have Richard Frimponopon, an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, Thompson Rivers University in Canada and a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences who has distinguished himself in academia and a legal profession to explore these uh, uh, issues and more with. You are watching The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Octoglo Ghana Limited and supported by Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank. I'm yours truly, Dana Kusia Kunidwa Santi Samuels. Welcome to The Hard Truth, sir. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you Thank very you so much. Thank you so much for, for being in a short time. Yes. Now, looking at your, your journey, sir, as a young boy from a very humble uh, background to an accomplished and recognized authority in the legal uh, widely, you know, uh, world. L let me ask you, how did you get there? I mean, is it easy? I mean, from everything, it's like it's so easy to get there, but how did you manage to, to get to where you are? I think it has been uh, a long journey, and mm -hmm. I think it's all started in Asokori, in the Ashanti region where I was born. Maybe I would like if you, t if you take us through your educational and career development. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, from the educational perspective, mm -hmm. I did my primary school at an institution known as a Perseverance Preparatory in Efijasi, in the Ashanti region. Then from there I went to Ascori Methodist JSS. And then from there I studied at Opokowari Secondary School. No, why not Prempe College? In Kumasi. No. I think Opokowari is better. Worst choice. <laughs> Prempe and Manfoy. Opokowari is certainly <laughs> better. And better in so many things. Well, well, that's but what you from, say. <laughs> from there I proceeded to the University of Ghana, um, where I did my Bachelor of Laws degrees. And then I went to the Ghana School of Law to complete uh, the professional mm -hmm. um, qualification. Um, after that, I, I left Ghana, I think, two days after my graduation. Which year was this? Uh, 2003. Long uh, time ago. To study in Cambridge, yeah, ah. about 13 years ago. Wow. So I did my first master's degree in Cambridge in commercial law. And then I did another master's degree in Harvard in 2004 mm. to 2005. Mm. Mm. And then from there, I started my PhD at the University of British Columbia in Canada, where I'm currently based. Okay. Yeah. But, but do you come home often? People stay there. Is it your first time coming home after 13 years? No, 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 no. I, oh, you I, do I come, come home back sometimes. almost every two years. Fantastic. For Fantastic. Yeah. But really good to have you here, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. So the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague has uh, been a part of a global justice system since, I think, 2012. <coughs> but it concentration on just say African issues has led to accusation of bias. Let me ask you, in your view, do you think that the um, ICC is targeting Africans inappropriately? What would you say? I, I think the starting point is to appreciate that the ICC was set up um, to pursue a very laudable objective, um, which is to ensure um, justice in very um, in, in cases where very heinous crimes have been committed. So the objective of the institution is uh, laudable and 
since its establishment in 2002, I think the organization has been doing some very good work. I, I guess that, but in, 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 you know, of the cases, so 10 cases being investigated by the court, yeah. nine involve African uh, countries, including trials so yeah. far. ICC arrests, you know, warrant have never, you know, have issued uh, these things to the Africans. I mm. want to know again, I just just targeting African countries. I, I think you can you can argue it that way, but I think you also have to appreciate that um, most of the cases, the ten cases which you mentioned, most of them were actually referred to the ICC by African governments themselves. When there's the, some backdoor, uh, something you know, some um, they would say, well, if if we don't handle, perhaps your grant to be taken away, or you know, some some kickbacks, you know, at the background. Uh, it's it's likely there was some pushing here and <laughs> there, but ultimately the fact is that these cases were referred to the ICC by. Um, the African states said uh, there are two w which was taken up by the prosecutor himself and herself um, recently. So that, 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 that is the fact. I think you cannot deny that um, um, most of the cases are concentrated on the African continent. I think it's also the case that if you look around the world, Africa looks like we have more problems um, than other regions of the world. Really? But, um, Definitely, when you're talking about inter international criminal justice, it, it, it has to apply to all regions of the world. So, uh, for example, we all know about the terrible situation um, going on in Syria, and mm. it's currently not on the list of the court, which is unfortunate. So, there's Why is that? Well, I think at the end of the day, you have to appreciate that there's some element of politics in the administration of criminal law. Because criminal law is administered. So why the interest then in African countries? Are we that vulnerable? To, to an extent, you can argue it that way, that yes, the criminal law tends to also target the vulnerable. And in this case, African states are the vulnerable um, in, in that perspective. But they, they, they have to find some way of accommodating. And I'm not sure whether the idea of pulling out of the organization, which is what a number of African countries are currently proposing. And I think last week, um, three sent their yeah. notice of withdrawal to the organization. I'm right. not sure whether that is the best um, um, alternative. Another alternative will be to try and work for reforms within the organization. And that, 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 that is possible because we have to remember the majority of states are African states, 34 out of um, I think 124 states are Africans, so they definitely have some degree of influence over the organization and it's possible that they can pursue internal reforms within the organization if that is what they want to do. With regards um, to, I would say, the prosecution of uh, certain heads of state mm. as with the uh, Kenyan president and Sudanese president yeah. that may, might have seen attempt to, you know, at the regime change or yeah. breach of sovereign choice for the electorate. Is it a valid assertion and can the, I would say, ICC salvage its image in this regard? I think, personally, I think that is totally unacceptable that a sitting head of state should be subjected to the kind of embarrassment that the Kenyan president, mm -hmm. the Sudanese president, mm -hmm. um, went through and is currently going through. I think at the end of the day, the International Criminal Court has to appreciate that these are elected leaders. So no matter the fault, I think you have to wait for them to leave office. And trying to prosecute them whilst they are in office also complicates situations in the countries. I think one of the reasons why the Sudanese president may never leave power is because of this warrant hanging over his neck. So it complicates situation within the country and that should be avoided. But of course, again, it's a question of what the, the states agree to. They agreed to the principle of no immunity for heads of state in the Rome Treaty. So mm. that is what they signed up for. And if the internal reform I'm talking about, if that should be put on the agenda, I think that is something worth considering. But I personally don't support the idea of subjecting a head of state to prosecution while the person is in office. And you don't do that even in national legal systems. Usually heads of state enjoy immunity 
from prosecution while they are in office in national legal system. So I don't see why internationally it should be different. Looking at the, I would say, the other side of the coin, wouldn't be, wouldn't it look so fair to say that despite, you know, the perceived unfairness and bias of the ICC, the court has played a, say, a vital role in um, reducing violent crime-related, you know, issues in the continent? I'm not sure whether they've in any way assisted in reducing violence, but I think the existence of the court certainly serves as a deterrent. Um, to some people and you see the ICC often being invoked during preceding elections and things like that. So there may be some deterrent effect mm. but I don't think the situation in the continent will be very different without the ICC. Again, do you also think that, you know, if we had had, a, say, a proportionate number of um, um, prosecutions outside the African or Africa within various countries that have ratified, let's say, the Rome Statutes, mm -hmm. the narrative would have been different from, you know, what we are seeing today. And will it really make any difference? Yeah, I think it, it, justice is always a question, sometimes a question of perception. Mm -hmm. So if the perception, and I think this one is true, it's a fact, that the institution is targeting only a certain group of people, then that is certainly unfair when we are aware that there are the horrible situations going on mm -hmm. in other parts of the world, in, I mentioned, Syria. Um, so, so who prompts, who prompts who? So who says, no, I mean, wait a minute, why not look at Syria? Wait a minute, why not look at, say, Kenya? Wait, I mean, do we have a say in that? Um, or let me put it, it so do 124 countries actually have a say in uh, who should be in the court? It's, it's a question of the process for getting cases to the court. There are, there are three main ways um, through which cases come before the court. So the state parties to the treaty can refer cases to the court, which is what some African states have done. Um, the UN's UN Security Council can also refer cases to the court. So African countries or countries can use that channel to um, send cases to the court. And the prosecutor herself can decide to investigate with the approval of the court uh, some cases. So these are the three mechanisms um, through which cases come before the court. And the first two states definitely have some influence over it in the sense that they can make direct reference to the court or work through the Security Council of the United Nations. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth with Akosia Konedu, only on Vice at One. Brought to you by Ecobank. <laughs> Fellow Ghanaians, as 7 December approaches, we must continue to remind ourselves that we only have one Ghana and that we must strive to maintain the peace and tranquility that we enjoy as a people. Though we may have different views and support different political parties, our hope is to see a prosperous and united nation where we can enjoy the fruit of development as a people together. Let us stand for peace before, during, and after the elections. My name is Nana Akustia Knidu Asante Samuels and I stand for peace. Bank, we see a great future, one that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries, it's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African and Ecobank is the Pan-African Bank. 
Welcome back. You're still watching The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Octoglo Ghana Limited and supported by Equibank, the Pan-African Bank. Um, lawyer Richard Frimpon upon is here. He's an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, St. or Thompson River, sorry, University in Canada. So, now, South Africa, um, I think Gambia and Burundi are bent on exiting the ICC mm. and there are predictions that Dr. Congo and Central Republic and you know Kenya, Kenya Namibia Uganda. would also follow suit. Let me ask again, do you think that this withdrawal from the ICC again by African countries is the right way to go to show their protest of the conduct of the ICC and does it really signal a mass you know exodus on African countries? Yeah, I think if South Africa goes, South Africa has a lot of influence on the continent. South Africa and Kenya work together, definitely a number of African countries will follow suit. And I think we have to appreciate that. But why are they leaving? That's the question. Why do they want to leave? I think you've already suggested, and it's a fact, that most of the prosecutions currently going on relate to situations in Africa. And there's the perception that the court is inappropriately targeted the continent. And it's something which even the African Union is concerned mm. about because I think one of the things the African Union has proposed and is currently attempting to do will be to expand the jurisdiction of what is known as the um, African Court of Human and People Rights mm -hmm. um, to encompass the kind of jurisdiction which is currently uh, being pursued by the International Criminal Court. So there's this idea that there must be an African-based institution to resolve some of these problems. Mm -hmm. But going back to your question, yeah. I certainly believe that if South Africa goes, if Kenya decides to follow suit, a number of African countries will do the same. But the question is whether that is the best approach. I think the countries have sent enough signal to the organization. And I think the time is now for the countries to African countries to try to pursue internal reforms within the organization using the various mechanisms which currently exist within the treaty. And as I pointed out, they, they have significant vote. It's a one country, one mm -hmm. vote system within mm -hmm. um, the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. So 34 countries, they have a lot of influence and they, they will be able to use it effectively if they want to. But Richard, you know, major powers, you know, such as China, Russia and the United States are not, uh, you know, signatories to, to uh, uh, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Yet three African countries, South Africa, Burundi, and, and, and I think Gambia, you know, deciding to pull out, there's been a lot of backlash for, um, I think, Amnesty International and the UN Secretary. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this add to the existing perception um, that the ICC is like the, you know, uh, Orwellian uh, farm animal? where, you know, it's more equal than others. Yeah, I think the perception is then, I think both sides of the divide are pursuing um, what is within their right under international law. International law does not force any country to sign on to treaties, and that is what China, the United States have done. So, and international law permits countries to withdraw from treaties, and that is what South Africa and Burundi and, and Gambia are trying to do. So both countries are pursuing their sovereign right. I don't think they should be criticized for that. It's a question of whether or not what they are doing is appropriate. And personally, I think pursuing internal reforms within the organization will be a more appropriate path than withdrawing from the organization. But they have the right to do that. Okay, but the uh, idea of an African criminal court was, I think, first suggested in 2004. Mm -hmm. But in 2012, um, this was given meaning in the decision to merge, I think, yeah. the African Human and People's Rights Court and the African Court, court of, of Justice, Justice to yeah. become the main you know, judi um, judicial organ yeah. uh, for the African Union, predominant yeah. you know, human rights for yeah. the, the continent. This has really not seen the light of day, you know, yeah. we could say that. So in your opinion again, Sir Richard, do you think that the African Court of, of Justice and Human Rights will ever really come to a force? And how effective, Sir, do you also think this court will be? That's a difficult question to answer because currently we have the African Court of um, 
human and people's right. Mm. And I wouldn't say it's a very active court compared to um, courts like the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So if you are looking at it from um, the perspective of its caseload, mm. then the African Court of Human and People's Rights is not a very active court. And it may be the case that if it gets acquires criminal jurisdiction, it will also not be very active. So Why? there's that real possibility mm. that African states will not refer some of these cases to the African is Court of Human Is it that we, we can't handle or what is it? I think sometimes it's a question of who is involved because most of these atrocities are committed by people <laughs> at a very high mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. and they have to make the reference. Mm -hmm. and it's unlikely they would do that. So it, it may be that the attempt to expand the jurisdiction of the um, African Court of Human and People Rights is just an attempt. It's part and parcel of this attempt to get out of the ICC. And, 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 and nothing really is substantial or significant will come out of it. Richard, the, uh, the amendment of the Malibu Protocol yeah. on the statute of the African Court of Justice and yeah. Human Rights to granting certain and, and leaders, certain presidents or leaders, you know, a certain immunity yeah. from prosecuting before the court, you know, raised much uh, more, uh, you know, displeasure from, from the human rights community. Do you think this is a ploy by African uh, heads of state to actually protect their personal interest can i say that no i i i believe that a certain head of state should enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution even when he's involved uh, yeah i think that that is consistent across legal system because remember that the head of state is the representative of the state you can't have a situation in which the head of state is being subjected to criminal prosecution and at the same time you expect him or her to function effectively within the state. That is why national constitutions have those immunity pro provisions. I think we have it in Ghana, other legal systems will have it. So that should not be a problem. But there should be no immunity after the person leaves office. That, that, that is how So So process. what? So we pile and pile and pile for eight years, you know, then you come to court. I mean, why not? Well, you said that's the court's decision, so I really don't know. Yeah, but how many instances... Why can't you just, you know, put them there, uh, prosecute them in court uh, whilst in office? No, as I said, you, the head of state cannot function properly if he's being prosecuted. You, you have to appreciate what the Kenyan president, for example, went through. How, why do you want a situation mm -hmm. in which the head of state mm -hmm. is being subjected to that embarrassment and you want him to come back the following day to take concrete decisions affecting the citizenry. I mean, criminal prosecution can always wait. We don't have to pursue it immediately. And usually there's no statute of limitation on these crimes. So you can be prosecuted any day. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth with Akosia Konedu, only on Vice at One. Brought to you by Ecobank. Bank, we see a great future, one that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries, it's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African and Ecobank is the Pan-African Bank. You are watching The Hard Truth and uh well, proudly brought to you by Octoglo Ghana Limited and supported by Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank. Richard Frimponopon, an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, Thompson River 
University uh, in Canada. So, you know, again, there's been some reports that um, the prosecutor's office of the ICC is ready to initiate a full investigation on a range of, you know, possible war crimes and war against humanity in Afghanistan, including some, you know, U.S. Uh, personnel. Again, do you think that this is really possible and are we likely to see the ICC and the U.S. in a possible collision course? Yeah, I think it's long overdue. I think we are all aware of the situation in Afghanistan, <sighs> which is terrible. Um, we are all aware of the situation in Syria, which is more terrible than um, the situation in many African countries. So there's certainly a case to be, to be made for that. Um, there will certainly be some issues because the United States will be somehow involved. But I think the International Criminal Court has the ability to prosecute and I think it will do a good job if it decides to take it on. And I think it's also important that the court is turning its attention away from Africa and looking mm -hmm. at other countries mm -hmm. where some of um, these injustices are being perpetuated. So I think it's an appropriate thing to do. Richard, position in the United States concerning uh, the ICC very widely and the Clinton administration, you know, signed the Rome Statutes in 2000 but did not really submit uh, it for uh, Senate ratification. The Bush administration, however, at the time of the ICC funding stated that it would not join the ICC. Now Obama came in and has subsequently re-established a working relationship uh, with the court. Let me ask what you foresee Donald Trump uh, are doing with uh, in regards to the ICC. Yeah, personally I don't um, foresee the United States signing up to the room um, statute anytime soon. I think um, definitely Obama was an internationalist and what would have expected um, that he would have done a little more in terms of getting the, the United States on, on to, um, as a member of the organization. Um, but certainly there is no support mm. for the organization in Congress and Congress is the one which um, has to ratify this treaty um, before they, it, it can become, uh, can enter into force in the United States. So I don't see Trump who, is, who doesn't look like an internationalist signing up onto this treaty. I don't think it will happen. Richard, before the uh, United States election, most polls in the U.S. and many more across the world, you know, tipped Hillary Clinton to win the presidential, you know, elections. Mm -hmm. Now, the world, you know, shocked or there was some shaking mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, Trump against all odds meshed mm -hmm. uh, uh, victorious on the D-Day. Yeah. Were you surprised, let me ask, let me ask by the outcome of the U.S. election? I was very surprised. I, I never expected, I think I told my class a million times that it will not happen. And I was very surprised that it happened. But I think we all have to appreciate that the United States is a very different country. Mm. And it tends to be very unpredictable. And this is a classic example where you cannot easily extend or you, you cannot easily understand what is going on in the country. because. In no other part of the world will you have such a guy as the president of the country, somebody <laughs> who is insulting women, who is insulting immigrants, who is a businessman and you don't know any of his connections, business dealings with them. We don't know a lot about this, mm -hmm. um, um, this guy.